Good morning, Liberty family. Will you stand with us? Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. We're so glad that you chose to worship the Lord on Mother's Day with us here today at Liberty. Father, we're so grateful to be in your house today. We thank you for your love and your mercy. God, we thank you for the privilege of starting a week out in your house. So God, today we leave all of our problems, all of our issues at the door. Father, we cast our mind to you. We focus on you. And we make this day all about you. God, we pray that what we say, what we do, what we sing, what we play in this place today, God, would bring honor and glory to your name because you are worthy of all of our praise. God, we ask that you meet with us today and be pleased with our worship. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Well, let's worship the Lord this morning.
God's house this morning say amen. amen amen members we're so thankful that you're here faithful worshiping God at Liberty Baptist today I see several new faces all across the auditorium today visitors we are so glad that you chose to worship with us today members make all of our guests feel welcome if you didn't receive a connection card on your way in you can see one of the guys standing at the back of the auditorium they have one for you Please just give us a little bit of information so that we have record of your visit. We are glad that you're here today. All right, so we introduced a new memory verse last week. Hebrews, actually memory verses, Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. And uh, everybody should be fairly familiar with these verses. Let's say them together. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you're glad to be in God's house today, Give someone a fist bump, a high five, handshake. Let them know you're glad to see them at Liberty this morning. Amen.
If you would, make your way back to your seats. You may be seated as we continue in worship this morning.
spoke countless stars ablaze only one could breathe life into clay only one could quiet raging seas only one has power to redeem only one spoke out the stars of blaze think about it only one could breathe life into clay only one can quiet raging seas. Only one has power to redeem. All the praise goes to Jesus. All the praise.
Sing just the voices, all the praise. All the praise goes to Jesus. All the praise to him alone. All the glory and honor forevermore. All the praise to him alone. Father, we give you all the praise today, all of our worship. Because you alone, Jesus, are worthy of our praise, deserve of our worship. God, we thank you for the reminder of who you are in those verses. The one that spoke the countless stars ablaze. The only one that breathed life into clay. Quiets raging seas, has power to redeem. You died our souls to save took your life back again how could we ever doubt that you have all the power God we praise your name today we're so thankful that we serve a God who can not a God who might not a God who did father a God that can and a God who does we thank you Jesus we worship you today father for who you are what you've done and what you will do Father, may we focus on you in our lives, that, Father, that we realize that you are right with us every step of the way. God, we praise your name for that. God, I pray that you would do great things in this place today. God, we feel your presence in this room. God, we ask that you stay with us through the remainder of the service, stir in our hearts. God, as your word is brought forth in just a moment, that, Father, that you would speak to us and do great things. We'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory for what you have done and what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Here I remind myself of what you said.
Well, amen. Thank you, Miss Hicks, and uh, thank you, band. I, I miss playing with you guys. I'm looking forward to being back, Lord willing, next week. Take your Bibles and turn in the New Testament, 2 Timothy uh, chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. You might not recognize this name, but a lady by the name of Anna Jarvis was the first one to suggest a national day of remembering moms and recognizing moms. And of course, today is Mother's Day. Uh, She had a memorial service for her mom on May the 10th, 1908, and she gave a carnation to everyone that attended that day because that was her mom's favorite flower. And it would not be long after that, just a few short years after that, Woodrow Wilson on May the 9th, 1914, by an act of Congress and as the President of the United States, he proclaimed the second Sunday of May to be Mother's Day. And here's what he said. He said, it's a time to publicly express our love and our reverence for the mothers of our great country. And I think we'd all agree that, that mothers are very special people. And if nothing else, they brought us into this world and gave us life, amen? If nothing else, I don't know your individual situation. I was blessed uh, with uh, having a great mother, and I miss her dearly. I can't wait. Heaven's going to be so sweet because I get to see mom. Uh, We think about moms this time of year, and and again, each of us have different thoughts and stuff, but uh, they were asking some second graders about mothers, and what they thought, and they asked them some questions. And now, the wonderful thing about children is you just, you just get the truth, right? Yeah, I mean, they don't dress it up. Uh, they just say it how it is. And so here's some questions that they asked uh, some second graders about their mothers. And maybe some of you can identify with this. Question number one was, why did God make mothers? And here's some of the top answers. Mostly to clean house is what some said. And then others said, to help us out of there when we were getting born. (laughs) To help us out of there when we were getting born. Amen, we got out of there, amen. Uh, Number two, why did God give your mother, give you your mother and not some other mom? Top answers. Number one, we're related. Second graders, remember? Number two, God knew she would like me a lot more than other people's moms like me. (laughs) Mother's love is special, isn't it? Question three, why did your mom marry your dad? Top answers. She got too old to do anything else with him. (laughs) And here here is another one. My grandmother said that mom didn't have her thinking cap on when she married him. (laughs) Question number four, who is the boss at your house? The top answer, well, I guess mom is because... She does a lot more than dad does around there. (laughs) You moms might be elbowing your husband right now. Question number five. Uh, What would it take for your mom to be perfect? Top answer. On the inside, she's already perfect. Outside, I think it's probably going to take some type of plastic surgery or something. (laughs) Again, second graders, they're about the seven, eight-year-old age, and they just say it how it is. Uh, brilliant uh, answers there, but I think we'd all agree again that moms are very special people, and if you're privileged to have your mom with you uh, today, then that is indeed a a rich blessing. I want to take just a moment uh, on this special day just to recognize our moms, and uh, if you're a mother here this morning, would you stand please? All right, let's give them a big hand this morning. All right, moms, thank you so much. And those of you that have moved on to the grandmother stage, then you're really uh, getting to enjoy the, the sweet, sweet part of life right now. I figured out, you know, I was a pretty tough dad, but I'm going to be a wimp as a grandpa. You know, I know it, I know it, I know it. I see my brother who's all hard and all that, you know, but when it comes to those grandbabies, he's just a big sissy, so... Anyway, I'm sure I'll be the same way, and probably some of you grandmothers are the same way uh, when it comes to the grandkids. The Bible's filled with a lot of great women, and we want to get to God's Word this morning. Great women and and great grandmothers and great mothers, and for instance, there's Sarah, the mother of Isaac, 
There's Rebecca, the mother of Jacob, Rachel, the mother of Joseph, and then unusual name, and I preached this on Mother's Day before, Jochebed, how would you like to have that name? She was the mother of who? You remember? Moses, Aaron and Miriam, you remember those guys? And there's a lot of women of faith in the Bible, and uh, I praise God for the great examples that we have both of men and women in the Scripture. And what they do, the Bible said of those stories in the Old Testament, a lot of people think, well, you know, that's all Old Testament, that's Israel, that's Jews. But the Bible said those things are recorded as examples for you and I. And so we look at the Bible and we can, we can learn. And the great thing about the Bible is it doesn't pretty things up. You know, King David, a man after God's own heart, he was also an adulterer and a murderer. You know, uh, that's not pretty. And yet God gives us hope in that we see in David's life, you can, uh, you can be way up here and then fall way down here and then God can take you way back up here. Amen? And so there's hope for all of us because of that. So this morning we meet uh, two ladies in the Scripture, perhaps less known mothers uh, or not as well known mothers in the Bible, but they were women of great faith. And uh, these two women gave to their children what I believe is the greatest gift that any mother could give to her child. Now when you think about parenting and grandparenting, we like to give our children things. We like to do for our children. And yet the greatest thing that we could ever do for our children we're going to see in this passage this morning. It's not fame. It's not fortune. But what we see in these two mothers is that they gave their children the gift of faith. The gift of faith. With that in mind, I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter number 1. And we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And Paul's writing here to Timothy in the second letter uh, to Timothy. And a great, great... Uh, epistles that Paul wrote and these to Timothy are some of my favorite and here's what he said in, in verse number one Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus to Timothy my dearly beloved son now he wasn't a biological son but he was an adopted son so to speak he was a spiritual son he was a young man that he poured his life energy and spirituality into. My dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. Now note in verse number 5 right here, Paul mentions two godly ladies that are greatly used of God to raise up a young champion, the young champion Timothy for Christ. And it says, And when I call to remembrance the unfringed faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that it's in thee also. Oh, how we need mothers and grandmothers like Lois and Eunice in America today. Amen? And above all else, we need women who will pour their faith into their children. Can I tell you this morning, moms, and even dads, this is certainly applicable to you as well. It doesn't matter if you give them wealth. It doesn't matter if you give them education. It doesn't matter if you give them a nice car and you give them means to succeed in this life if they fail in eternity. Amen? The most important thing that we can do for our children is to give them our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we talk about faith, what are we talking about? We're talking about that which we believe and that which we live out, really. I mean, we believe a lot of things, but the truth is there's a lot of things we say we believe that we really don't live. Things that don't really impact our life. When we talk about faith, we're talking about our, our faith, that which we believe, and our practice, how we behave. And so faith is what we believe and how we behave. And when we, when we do what God's Word contains, simply God's Word, how do we know the will of God? By reading God's Word. Amen? God speaks in three ways. God speaks through the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the man of God. That's how He speaks right there. Not through the enchiladas down at El Chico's or the pizza at Pizza Hut, okay? 
People have a lot of things that come to mind that are extra biblical that God doesn't have anything to do with. God speaks through His Word, through His Spirit, and through His man. That's it right there. The best thing that can be said about any mother is simply this, that she believed God's Word and she passed it down, passed down that belief to her children, amen? I mean, at the end of the day, when we think about our moms, we love our moms, amen? I love my mom, I miss my mom. And it's good to have my nieces and nephews here. And, and to them, my mom is Nana. And, uh, and my sister has adopted that term, Nana. And she's a great Nana. And, uh, and, and they each knew uh, my mother. Uh, the only one of the, the grandchildren that didn't get a chance to meet her is my son Christian. My wife was expecting him. And my mom passed October 29th of 2000. And he was born uh, in January of 2001. And uh, so he never got to meet her. But we've, we've told him many things about her. We've passed on to him grandma's faith, Nana's faith, and what Nana was like. And, uh, and I, I thank God for the time that we had with her, and I can't wait to see her again. There, there's nothing greater that a, that a mom or a grandmother can pass down to their children than their faith. You know, the Bible says this, without faith it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that. So the best thing that can be said about any mother is that she had faith in Christ and she passed that faith on to her children. So what is it about the faith of Lois and Eunice that I would say is the greatest gift that any mother could pass down to their children? Well, I want you to notice, first of all, their faith was a great gift because it was a saving faith. Amen? I don't know about you, but there's nothing better in this life than being saved. I tell you, friend, I've walked the low way. I've been lost. I've been undone. I've been a church member that didn't know Jesus. The other side of the fence is so much better, being saved in Jesus. Listen to what he said in, in, in verse number 5 again. Paul writes, and he says, When I call to remembrance the unfringed faith that is in thee, he's talking to Timothy, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and basically we could say this, and then in thy mother Eunice, so you see a pattern here, you see a legacy, and I'm persuaded that it's in you also, he says. Now, what do we know about the, the saving faith of these two mothers? You have to go over to Acts chapter number 16, and Paul is on his secondary mission, second missionary journey. He's establishing churches. And how did they establish churches back in uh, biblical times? Well, they established them the way God intended them to be established. They went in. They shared the gospel of Jesus. People got saved. People got discipled. And then they went out and led people to Jesus Christ. They didn't do it by swapping church members back and forth. They didn't do it by giving away a bunch of stuff. They went in and Acts chapter 17 says, and they turned their world upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I love what it says in, the, in Acts 17. It says, uh, these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. These men of the city were going, man, here they come. There, there, there are people getting saved out there. There's people getting saved over here. Churches are being established. And now they've come to our city. Wouldn't that be a great thing when people see us coming? They know that we're going to share the gospel. And so that's how God intended the church to grow, by the way. Not by stealing church members from other people. And not by just going and doing our own thing, but by establishing it His way. Leading people to faith in Christ. Listen to what Acts 16 says in verses 1 through 5. It says, then he came, he's talking about uh, Paul here, to, to Debray and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothus, and the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have uh, go forth with him, he's talking about Timothy, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they uh, delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. So Timothy's mother is described here as a Jewish woman that believed. What did that mean? She believed the gospel. She believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, both Lois, Timothy's grandmother, 
and Eunice, Timothy's mother, were won to Christ during Paul's first missionary journey. They repented of their sins, and they turned from their sins and gave their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were gloriously saved. And God had forgiven them. And what happens when you're forgiven of your sins and the weight of sin is forgiven, and the Holy Spirit of God comes to live in you, then your life all of a sudden has purpose and meaning. And they realized that. There's so many people going about uh, this way and that way, and they're trying to fill this God-sized hole in their life with all of these things. And I've done that myself, my friend. But those things can never fill what only God and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ can fill. You can try to fill it with alcohol. You can try to fill it with drugs. You can try to fill it with uh, relationships uh, uh, with other people. And a lot of people do that. They jump from bed to bed and relationship to relationship. And now it's so easy. You can even get on your computer and meet these people online. And next thing you know, you know you're having uh, something with them. And yet none of that will fill what only the Lord Jesus Christ can fill. But when he fills that void, when he comes to reside in your life, and folks, I'm not, I'm not offering and I'm not talking about religion. I'm mentioning here what it means to be in Christ Jesus, to be forgiven of sins. It's a relationship with Almighty God through the person of Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit of God living in you. And I know what it's like to be dead in trespasses and sin and then to be quickened by the Holy Spirit. You ever been shocked before? I've been shocked by Jesus. And I don't say that, uh, you know, to be in any way disrespectful, but I'm telling you, that's literally what happens when Christ comes into a life. That life is dead, and the Bible says you're quickened by the Holy Spirit. It's like, bam! And all of a sudden, you're alive in Christ. Living people act a whole lot different than dead people, right? You don't believe that, just go down to the funeral home and you'll see. Unfortunately, as a pastor, I've I've been around a lot of dead people over the years. More than I care to be around, you know? I remember when we were in pastoral ministry class, me and Brother uh, Copeland, we had a dear friend, uh, Terry Barnett. This guy's a big old boy back then. I'm, I'm talking close to a 450 pounder. And not just big, he was big, just a big guy. And he loved Jerry Clower, and he had laughed like Jerry Clower, and just a big spirit of a man as well. And you know what? I don't know that there's very much that he, he hadn't seen or was afraid of, but I remember when we went down to the funeral home in pastoral ministry class, Dr. D.L. Moody took us down there, and there was a dead person in the room there on the table, and uh-uh, no, he's going to be a pastor. No, I'm not going in there. And, of course, you know, my personality type, you know, I'm right up there in the, in the middle of everything. And, you know, it was, it was respectful. They were covered and everything, but they were dead. And I'll tell you what, there's a big difference in somebody that's dead and somebody that's alive. And I know what that's like. Lois and Eunice were saved. They were made alive in Christ. And that's what they wanted above all else for Timothy. For him to be alive in Christ. So not only, notice here, this faith is a great gift because it's a saving faith, but number two, it's a seen faith. Go back to verse number five of 2 Timothy 2, or verse one, or chapter one, excuse me. And and when I call to remembrance the unenfringed faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I want to drive that home. First, there's a succession that happens here with grandma to mom to son. And, and I don't know if Timothy had children, but I'm guessing if he did, that it would go down to that. And generation after generation, he said, and I'm persuaded that it's in you also. So these two mothers, they had a genuine faith. Notice that word in our King James Bible, unfringed. That's a word that we don't use a lot today. But what it simply means is this, without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. It means genuine. It means the real deal. Don't you like it when you meet people that you just, what you see is what you get? They're, just, they're the real deal. You know, one of the things I love about my, my brother, and, I, and we go back and forth and give each other a hard time, but you know what? He is who he is, and that's what he is, and he don't try to dress it up or change anything to impress people. 
And, you know, there's something to be said about that, just being the real deal. Not, there's no pretense. There's not putting on a show for, for people. You know, a lot of people are good at putting on this facade when they're around certain groups or certain people. Or the pastor comes by and it's like, whoa, you know, hiding this and hiding that. You know, I know what it's like to be lost. You don't have to hide that from me. I was that. And I know what it's like to be saved now. Now, if you're saved and you got some things in your life that uh, shouldn't be there, then, you know, I remember Brother Ray telling the story years ago of, uh, of he pulled up, and this was back in the early days, and, you know, everybody was suit and tied up and certain haircuts and women dresses this and a lot of rules back then, a lot of things. And he pulled up to make a visit, and as he was pulling up, the guy didn't see him, but he, the guy had just pulled out a pulled out a beer, was getting ready to pop it open, and he saw the pastor pull up. Well, the pastor saw him, and he saw the pastor, but he didn't know the pastor saw him. And so he took that beer, and he stuck it in his shirt and hid it up under his arm. And, and the pastor came up to talk to him, and so he's holding this beer up under his shirt against his bare skin that's freezing cold. And the pastor said, I stood there and talked to him for an hour. He was probably numb by the time I got done with him. But, you know, anyway, well, I had it. Well, hide it. If you like to drink a beer, then, you know, drink a beer. But, you know, don't put on. And I said all that to say this. Lois and Eunice, they had a genuine faith. It wasn't put on for the preacher. It wasn't church playing. You know, that's the unfortunate thing with so many folks. We've gotten so good at playing church. And church has become big business in our world today. God never intended it to be that, my friend. It's been likened to a lot of things, but I like the analogy, it's a hospital for the, for the sick to come and get healed, amen? And if you're, you come, whether you're lost and need to be saved, let me tell you, you've got a sin-sick soul that needs salvation, amen? You need to be saved, you need to be rescued, you need to be redeemed. But even after we're saved, we still, we get muddied up from this world that we walk around in. We get dirtied up, we brush up against things that get on us. That's why I'm so grateful for 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Their faith was genuine. They weren't pretending. They weren't playing church. The Lord Jesus had touched their lives and, 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 and Timothy could clearly see it. He could clearly see it. Now, moms, I want to ask you a couple of questions this morning. Number one, do you have a saving faith? Amen. On Mother's Day, the most important thing that, that could happen to you and your family is for you to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's simply this. If you turn from your sin and by faith turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the greatest gift that you can ever give your children is a saving faith. But you can't give that which you don't possess. Do you understand that this morning? In order to pass that on, you've got to have that. And, 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 and number two, do you have a sane faith? The reason... Timothy was so greatly influenced by Lois and Eunice was they lived their faith out before him. They lived it out. It was genuine. It was without hypocrisy. They lived at home what they lived at church. The thing is, folks, and this, moms, listen to me. You, someone has said this, you can con a con and you can fool a fool, but you can't kid a kid. More things are caught than taught. And it doesn't matter what you say in your testimony at church if you don't live it out at home. And I'm talking about your life choices. I'm talking about your decision. Now let me tell you, I'm not standing up here like I've got everything all, all perfect in my life and I never have a bad day and I never get, lose my temper. You ask my sons, you know, they, they can tell you. Amen, Soren. That's my, that's my great nephew there. They can tell you, you know what? Rick Ross has bad days, and I know that you do as well. I'm talking about not just a, a listen, I'm not just talking about a moment in time. I'm talking about your life. See, I think if we probably, any one of us, if you look at just this pinpoint in our life, you might find a high or you might find a low, right? But that's not what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about the picture, the big thing, the big picture who you are. You see, who you are is not who you are when you're here. Who you are is who you are when you're everywhere else. 
Do you have a sane faith? Well, listen, we can't, we can't kid a kid. They know. And the, and, and the thing about children, they have built in hypocrite detectors. And, and one of the most difficult things that, from my perspective as a, as a parent is dealing with wayward children and moms and dads that love them very much and when, when I'm dealing with them only to find out that the dad or, or mom are doing the very things that they're upset that their kids are doing. Okay, I'll, I'll give you an illustration. Y'all pray for my dad. He's going to be having open heart surgery here in the next week or so. Uh, they're right now getting his blood straightened out. He's in the hospital and he's not happy about it, I'm telling you. So if room 922, you go visit him. If he's grumpy, just give him a little break because he's not happy about having to be in the hospital. He wants to do it at home, and of course you can't do it at home because it's very risky what they're doing, just getting him off the blood thinners. But when, when 1970s, we lived over on the southwest side of town over there, and, and I worshipped my dad. I was blessed with a wonderful dad and a mom. And my dad and mom... Uh, we're saved and they took us to church at, a, at an early age from the very early points of our life. I remember not going to church and then at, around the time of first grade was when my dad was saved and we, we started going to Memorial Baptist Church just before Liberty existed and, and uh, we went there with Dave and Bobby Allen, we went there with Jack and Cynthia Pavador, uh, a lot of people, uh, Larry and Connie Cantwell, all of us, we went there together back in the 70s. Well, my dad, <laughs> he chewed tobacco back then. And now my mom, she was a very prim and proper lady, and she didn't like that none. She didn't like, she didn't like the smoking, but she didn't like the chewing the tobacco either, but she would take the tobacco chewing it over the smoking it, so you're not smoking at my house. So anyway, he quit smoking when my sister was born, but he uh, chewed this tobacco. And uh, I don't know what got him onto that. You know, we were around that stuff all the, all the time, my great-grandparents, my grandparents, everybody. But uh, Dad always have a chaw of red man in his mouth, you know, or, you know, walking around like that. And I thought it was cool, you know. If you want to be a real man, you've got to have a big old plug or something there with some drip coming out of the side. I had a, my great-great-grandmother, she dipped that snuff, that powder stuff, and went to bed with it. My mom used to talk about it. She'd wake up, and it would be dribbling out of her mouth on her pillow. Remember outlaw Josie Wells, that lady? Yeah, it was like that kind of snuff. Anyway, sidetracked there. But my dad was chewing this tobacco. Well, back then, anybody could go buy tobacco. And so guess what? You know, little 10-year-old Ricky did. That's what they called me back then. I went up to the corner store. Bought me a comic book and a big old pouch of mail pouch tobacco. And uh, me being the genius that I was, I thought, you know, i got to hide this or I'll get in trouble. So the one place that Dad will never find it is under the seat of his 55 Chevrolet hot rod that he loved. What was I thinking? He found it, of course. And he co comes to me, he goes, what is this? And I'm like, uh... Rhonda did it, not me, it's not mine, but no, I owned it, I didn't lie to him, I owned it, and he goes, and here's what he said, he goes, why did, why did you do it? I said, well, I see you doing it, and I just want to do what you do, and uh, he goes, well, here's the thing, you get a freebie this time, if I see you doing it again, I'm going to make you eat the whole thing and swallow it, and when my dad said something, my dad meant it, so guess what, I didn't do it again, <laughs> but why was I doing that? Because my dad did it. Why do we do so many of the things that we do? Because mom did it. Or daddy did it. And the, the really cool thing is, is that when mom and daddy do really good things, that kids do that too. Amen? But I think we all understand that we don't always do the good things. And I include myself in that statement. And these habits... And these choices, they get on our kids. We're talking about a seen faith. What they see when, when we model for them Jesus, when they see Jesus in us, guess what? They're going to want to be saved. 
They're going to want to turn from their sin. They're going to want to follow Jesus. They're going to want to serve God. When they see mom and dad doing it, that's what they're going to desire. Amen? Actions always speak louder than words. And, 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 and here's the thing. We're speaking by our actions. The question is not whether we are or we're not. The question is what are we saying? Amen? Let me tell you how God, good God has been for Rick Ross. God gave me a mother whose faith was seen in her private life and in her public life. Now, I've openly told you my mom could be a tornado with a wooden spoon. You get her riled up, and let me tell you, it's, it's going to fly. And she was, I mean, in a, she'd go from zero to 60 with that spoon in a New York minute. Just ask my brother. And, uh, but she loved the Lord Jesus. She loved her family. And we all knew that, and we all know it today. And she ran a tight ship at home because of what she believed and the faith that she, she walked in. I, I, I'm not only blessed that God gave me a, a, a wonderful mother, but God gave me a wonderful wife. And y'all pray for her. The illness that she has has had her down here for several weeks now. and She's not able to be here today, and it, and it breaks my heart. But I know this, and my sons could tell you she's got a genuine faith. What you see here at church is what you see at home. And uh, pastor's kids, a lot of times people say, you know, pastor's kids are the worst kids. I'm happy to say that I don't believe my kids are the worst kids. And the reason is I, I, we have tried to live by the grace of God and to his glory. What we are at church is what we are at home. And my wife's probably done a better job than I have at that. But I tell you, when, when they were little and early on in the ministry, when I thought I had to be here at 5 o'clock every morning and stay to midnight every night, she was the one that was teaching them the Word of God. She was the one that was singing Bible choruses to them. She was the one making sure they got dressed and were at church and were ready and prepared when, because I was here early getting ready to preach and stuff, and it was Mama. It was so influential in their life. It was mama that would sit there by them in the bathtub and go over their Awana verses with them back then when they were memorizing the Word of God. Today, both my, my mother and my wife, their children rise up and call her blessed. Amen? Why? Because they both had a saving faith and a seen faith. Let me show you the last thing to this morning. There was something else about Lois and Eunice that was what I believe is a great gift of faith that they passed on to Timothy and what was it? It was, it was a shared faith. And I want you to turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and I want to show you something here. We've moved from chapter 1 to chapter 3. And here Paul has given Timothy some very important information. If you remember this passage, it starts out with uh, Paul begins to list all the things that's going to be going on in the last, the last days and, and the difficulty uh, that will, it, it'll be a tough time to be faithful. It'll be a tough time to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, not only in his life, but in his ministry. And he says this in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 14, he says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Now, I love that. In other words, do the things that you learned and the things you've been assured of, knowing of whom... Thou hast learned them. Timothy had learned some things and been assured of some things, but notice who taught him, who assured him. Verse 15, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Here is where we see the connection of a shared faith. Lois and Eunice shared the Word of God with Timothy. He says right there, and that thou from, notice this, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. From a child, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. But moms, write this verse down. Romans 10, 17. It says this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. God. Faith. That's what we're talking about. Faith. It wasn't fame. It wasn't fortune. It was their faith that they passed down. 
How does that come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And moms, here's the thing. You've got to possess it first before you can pass it on. You possess it and then you practice it by the grace of God, amen? And then it it goes a step further in in your life and in your family. What do you do? You promote it. And, and, And for alliteration purposes, let me say this. I would even say you push it. You push them towards that. You know, we got parents, and don't say, well, I just don't want to push my babies towards church. And You push them towards everything else. You know, br- go brush your teeth. I don't want to brush my teeth. Go brush your teeth. Why? You don't want their teeth falling out by the time they're six, right? You're going to the doctor. I don't want to go to the doctor. You're going to the doctor. Do I have to get a shot? Yeah, you got to get shots today. I don't want to get shots. Well, you're going to get shots. Why? You don't want them to catch the measles. All these things that we thought were done away with back in the 60s, yeah, guess what? They're back. And you, you get your inoculations. We had an old nurse. She was an old Army nurse from World War II, maybe World War I or the Civil War. I'm not for sure. Miss Franklin. Oh, my word. Anybody remember Miss Franklin back in the day? Holy mackerel. She worked for Dr. Collins. She was mean. She weighed probably about 60 pounds. And, I mean, she didn't even fill out her, her white stock, nurse stocking. She, I mean, those were like uh, wrinkles, like an accordion, because her legs weren't even big enough to fill those out. But when she come in there, let me tell you, she'd jerk a knot in your tail in a New York minute. And when she gave a shot... You didn't get a good dose of Miss Franklin unless you had a bruise that lasted for a couple of weeks, you know, from that shot. You want, are we going to see Miss Franklin? Yep. I don't want to go see Miss Franklin. Well, guess what? What am, I, what am I saying here? We push them towards everything else. Dad, you love sports? I love sports. My kids played sports, basketball, soccer, football, from the time they were in Little League. Uh, Christian got his clock cleaned in one game in football. He was playing football and soccer uh, at the same time of the season. He was playing for the West Wolves. And, uh, and back then, the age group was pretty broad. So you have these little bitty kids, and you have these big old kids. Well, this big old kid cleaned his clock, and he, took, he said, Coach, I'm coming out of the game. <laughs> and the coach said, you want to go back in? Nope. Why don't you go back? Nope, I'm done. <laughs> That's all it took for him. He wasn't going to get, get his clock cleaned anymore. But they, we played sports, and I love sports. I, love, I played them. I love them. Uh, and you know what? When my kids played sports, I didn't make them play any particular thing. They tried things. But once you commit to it, guess what? You're going to do it. I don't want to go to football practice. Well, you're going to football practice. Well, I don't want to go to basketball. You're going. And I pushed them towards that. Why? Because I was teaching them about commitment. We don't always get into things that are really good, but once we commit, we got to do it because it's the right thing to do. What am I saying here? We possess Jesus Christ. And then daily through the Word of God, we practice Jesus Christ before our kids. And, and, and then there comes a time we promote Him, or if need be, we, we push our kids towards Him. You say, well, Pastor, you know, I don't, I'm not for sure about that. Well, let me read one more passage for you, and then we'll be done this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want you to turn there, if you would, please. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the last book of the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five. These are the books that Moses authored under divine inspiration. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I want to read this whole chapter here because in the context, this is amazing. There's some particular things that that we can apply to our lives, but in the context, this is all amazing. And let's begin reading verse number 1. Deuteronomy 6 verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God command to teach you that ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it. They're on their way to the promised land. They've been freed from the bondage of of, of the Egyptian slavery, and they're heading to the promised land. 
By the way, the promised land is not a picture of, of heaven, okay? It's a picture of the Christian life. Well, I thought it was heaven. No, there's giants in the land. There's giants, there's battles to fight. In heaven, there's no giants, there's no battles to fight or anything like that. The promised land is a type or picture of the victorious Christian life. That God says, I'm giving it to you. Now notice what he says here. You're going to possess this, and this is what God wants for us. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all His statutes and His commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. There's a blessing attached to it. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that thou may, uh, ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them. Now here's what, where it gets applicable to us specifically. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk with them when thou sittest down in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware to thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not and wells dig which thou diggest not, and vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. Now he's talking about all the blessings here associated with doing the word of God and teaching it to your kids and your kids' kids and your kids' kids' kids. Then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are around about you. A lot of people doing that today. Well, other, serving other gods? Yeah, houses and cars and jobs and careers and money and market accounts. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Mesa. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to cast out all thine enemies from before thee, as the Lord hath spoken. And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments with the, which the Lord, notice this, our God hath commanded you. I love that. The kids have adopted God now. Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with the mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders and great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all of these statutes. Well, kids ask, why do we go to church? Why do we read the Bible? Because the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So what does that mean in a nutshell for you and I? It means get the word of God into your life and then practice it before your kids' lives and they can adopt it then into their lives. Amen? And you can't sow into their lives what you don't know in your own life. Amen? Now we're talking to moms today because moms have a great impact. They are the first impact on children. But I'm talking to daddies too. And I'm talking to 
grandmas and grandpas, and aunts and uncles, and I'm talking to friends and close family members. Along with the Bible, there's a lot, of, a lot of tools we have today. There's Christian music everywhere. There's Bible games now. I mean, and, and here at Liberty, King's Kids. Why do we do King's Kids? So we can have free babysitting for our kids? No, so they can learn the Word of God. And so, Mom and Dad, it's incumbent upon you to help your kid just like you want them to succeed in school, just like you want them to succeed in sports. You help them succeed in learning the Word of God. And we've given you a, an easy way to do it because we're doing essentially part of your job for you here at the church. King's kids, think about church camp. Church camp, just time to play and spend a bunch of money to do it. No, it's about being with God's people and God's uh, other teens of like mind and like faith. And it's about hearing from the Word of God. And some of the greatest memories of my life happened at a church camp. And what does it say when we, we'll send them to a sports camp, but we won't send them to a church camp? Or church camp's not important. Well, they don't want to go. Well, they don't want to brush their teeth. They don't want to get their shots. They don't want to go to school. But guess what? It's what's best for them. Amen? And it's part of passing along what we possess. Amen? And today I thank God for mothers and grandmothers like Lois and Eunice. Why? Because they had a saving faith. And it was a seen faith and it was a shared faith. Amen? And let this message today be to all of us, starting with me. I'm, I'm, I've got kids, but I'm not, I haven't got into the grandkid part yet. And I already told you, I'm going to be a big wuss when it comes to grandkids. But I don't need to be. There needs to be, when I have my, my chance to influence them, I need to influence them in the right way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we all make a lot of mistakes. But here's what I've learned. As long as there is oxygen going in and out of my body, there's always time to do the right thing starting right now. It doesn't matter about yesterday. It doesn't matter about last year. What matters is right now and everything that happens after that. Amen? That's why Paul said, forget those things that are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. He said, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? It's looking unto Jesus, our Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Laying aside the things of this world that sidetrack us and looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. This time is a time of invitation here at Liberty. You can go, well, what's that all about? Well, it's a time when nobody's going to be looking around. Every head's going to be bowed and every eye's closed. It's a time of privacy because we want people to be comfortable in what they need to do right now between them and God. And for somebody this morning, perhaps it's, you know what, you need to make the decision to quit playing religion and to proclaim a relationship with Jesus Christ. You go, well, how do I do that? Well, what you do, you just simply come forward. Nobody's looking around. You'll take Brother Bush by the hand, or if you'd rather talk to me, I'll step down off the platform. What we'll do is get you with somebody that can take you to a private room, and in, in privacy with just you and them, can show you in the Word of God what you need to know about being saved, and, and you can accept Christ today. That's what someone needs this morning. Maybe a mom, maybe a grandma, maybe a dad or a granddad. Maybe you're here this morning and you can go back to a time when, when you accepted Christ. You might not remember the exact day or the time or the sermon or any of those things. I remember the day but and the time, but I don't remember the, the message. But I remember, like it was yesterday, what God did in my life. Maybe you can, like me, you can go back to that time and identify when you were made alive in Christ. And yet somewhere along the way, priorities shifted and things kind of got out of whack in your life like it often does for all of us. 
And what you need this morning is just kind of to draw close unto God and to maybe a course correction, maybe just to come back. Jesus talking to the church at Ephesus, he said, you know, they, were, they did some amazing things and there were so many good things, but there was one thing. He said, I've got one thing against you. And that was they had left their first love. Maybe you can remember a time when Christ and serving Him was more important and it, and it, it, was, it was so different, so new, so fresh, so exciting. Can I tell you, you can, you can get that again. It's like a back of pray, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of years. You can get that in the midst of years. The joy of your salvation, that's what David prayed. Return unto me the joy of my salvation. It can only happen by getting all the stuff in our lives that don't need to be there out and getting more of Jesus in. Because with Jesus comes the joy. Because he's our purpose. He's our reason for being. He's the only one that can fill that hole that we're each born with. What's your need this morning? Father, have your will in your way in this invitation. We'll give you the glory for all that you do in Jesus' name.